a happy feast of Corpus Christi to you all today. Today, Holy Mother Church celebrates the great solemnity of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's what Corpus Christi means, the body of Christ, and so it's a liturgical celebration, a mass like all other masses, but the prayers and our external devotional worship indicates and gives a special emphasis to the reverence we give to the real presence of Jesus hidden under the appearance of bread and wine in the sacred species. And unfortunately, in many places, unfortunately due to the COVID protocols, there may have been a Eucharistic procession in some places, or maybe due to bad weather, uh, which we may experience today here at South Union. Uh, the Catholic faithful would gather in parade with the Eucharistic Lord exposed in a monstrance as a public testimony of our belief and our love and our worship and our reverence and our adoration of Christ, who is uniquely present in the Eucharist. Every Mass is a celebration of the body and blood of Christ, but this today, Corpus Christi, a special celebration to reemphasize what we believe as Catholics and what we hold as dear. We know that at every Mass, we do what Jesus did at the Last Supper and what he completed on Good Friday on the altar of the cross. At the Last Supper, Jesus took bread and wine. He gave thanks and pronounced a blessing. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples. He takes, he thanks, he breaks, he gives. These four verbs to take, thank, break, and give are, are four verbs that are consistent throughout the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 26, St. Paul's narrative on the Last Supper. And we do this at every Mass where we, in adoration of the Lord, in gratitude, because the word Eucharist means thanksgiving, Jesus giving thanks to the Father in the Holy Spirit, offering himself under the appearance of bread and wine, but this practice of giving thanks, taking the bread, giving thanks, breaking it, and giving it. This is a directive Jesus gave. It was established by him and it points to a deeper reality. The bread is a sign, but more than a sign, it is a sacrament. It is a sign that the church has spent years refining. We explain it more deeply. And if you look at the history of Eucharistic theology, and there's a very good book I would recommend, it's by a Father James O'Connor called The Hidden Manna. And it really is a, a history of the development of the Catholic doctrine on the Eucharist. From the earliest days of the church up until our present day, including some very beautiful writing by St. Paul VI. But Father O'Connor does a marvelous job of giving us a history of what we believe and some of the confusion that surrounded the Eucharist, different heresies that cropped up over the years, but ultimately, what we believe about Jesus, the reality of his presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity, and what we accept in faith. Because what appears to be bread and wine after the consecration at the Mass is no longer ordinary bread and wine. But we do believe is the, the flesh and blood of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And it's, it's interesting, Father O'Connor talks a little bit in that book about the, the early history and the practices of the early Christians, but also if you look at other histories on the, the practice and the liturgy, what the early Christians did to reserve that special bread that had been taken and thanked over, that had been blessed, that had been broken, that had been given, to save it for the sick, to save it for the martyrs, those who had confessed their faith, who were in prison, who were about to go to die, who would be executed because they were Christians, but because this Eucharistic bread had been saved, they would be able to receive the body of the Lord before they died. And so the early Christians have been reserving the Blessed Sacrament for years. And our external practices then have reflected that. In the early days, they just kept the Eucharist in a box, in a little sacristy. The churches themselves did not yet have tabernacles. That was a later development. But over time, we put a, a tabernacle in our church. And here, 
in the Chapel of Divine Mercy. The tabernacle is front and center in the middle of the high altar. Well, that was not always that way. It was not always done that way. Uh, there's a variety of tabernacles, actually. It's interesting in uh, the Abbey of Cluny, around the year 1000, they describe a hanging tabernacle that was actually dove-shaped, and they would lower it down, and they would put the Blessed Sacrament in this dove-shaped tabernacle, and it would rise up like the Holy Spirit coming down, bringing the Eucharistic Lord, and then it would go up. It was a very, very interesting the way that the faith has developed until to our present practice today, which is a very good one, and still we are able to take communion to the sick, to have the Blessed Sacrament reserved, but especially then too for us to come to our churches and to adore the Lord, because we as Catholics believe that his presence abides even after the Mass is over. It's not just a temporary presence, but so long as the appearance of the bread or the wine, until that becomes corrupt and those accidents are corrupted or diminished to such a degree that you can no longer identify the accidents of, of bread or wine, the reality of God present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, he's truly there. And so our, our practices, our liturgical practices reflect that. And we have over the years continued this so that when we come to our churches today, we are able to come and adore him who we believe to be the Lord Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And on this feast of Corpus Christi, it is traditional to have a special time then of Eucharistic exposition when you would put a consecrated host in a monstrance, that vessel that looks like a sunburst, and maybe to process around maybe to just have on the altar for adoration, to revere the Lord, to love him, to show him your time, to open your heart to him. Because Jesus has given himself to us completely in his flesh, in his blood, in his divinity. We are privileged to eat and drink the flesh and the blood of the Son of God. And he says this in today's gospel when he says, Amen, amen, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Jesus describes something very radical here because as you go on through the rest of the John chapter 6 where we get this gospel passage from today's Mass, we know that the Pharisees challenge him, many of his disciples will desert him, only his apostles will stay. And it's because of these words that he says, to eat my flesh. He, as St. John writes it down, the term, the Greek term is trogon. It's very graphic. It means to chew, to gnaw, to munch. Literally, like tearing flesh off a bone almost. That word to eat, trogon. And then the word for flesh that he uses is very graphic, sarks. Flesh that has been stripped of its skin. It's being prepared to be eaten. And so many depart from him on this teaching, on this teaching of the Eucharist. There was no mistaking what the Lord was talking about. And he does not back off when they all leave. He doesn't say, oh, I was just speaking figuratively. This is what puzzles me, one of the things that puzzles me about all those who depart from him at this time. Because by the time Jesus has given this bread of life discourse, when he has preached this about eating his flesh, drinking his blood, and receiving eternal life, just a few of the miraculous things he has done, he's, he's turned water into wine. He's met with a Samaritan woman and told her her sins. He's read her soul. He heals a boy with a fever. In John chapter 5, he heals the man who was lame for 38 years by the pool at the sheep gate. And then just earlier in John chapter 6, he feeds the 5,000 with the miraculous multiplication of the loaves 
and the fish. And so he has already more than proven himself to be someone who is not of this world. At least for the person of faith, they can say, my goodness, what, what is, who is this man? But this was too much for them. This was too much, this, <clears throat> this teaching on the Eucharist. But he does not say, oh, I was speaking figuratively. Come back. No, he sticks with it. Because a God who makes this kind of a promise is a God who is also not going to assault and insult our senses in such a way that we're going to be cannibals, because that is actually an accusation that is leveled against uh, Catholics at times. Oh, your, your, your cannibalistic belief. But it's, it's not like that. It's not that. He is going to be able to feed us in a way with the reality of his flesh and blood and his life and his divinity. Because he's already, again, proven himself capable of doing miraculous things. He wants us to eat his flesh and to drink his blood. In this discourse, he invokes what had gone on in the desert with Moses. And we hear about that in the first reading in the book of Deuteronomy. Because the Israelites, Moses had led the Israelites out of Egypt. And when they run out of water and food is scarce, they want to go back to Egypt. They want to go back to the old way. And God provided for them. He provided manna for them to nourish them. And keeping in mind that there were rules with how you collected the manna, and the day before the Sabbath you collected enough for two days. If you tried to stock up too much before that, the, the manna would corrupt, it would get worms in it. But for the Sabbath, the day bef before the Sabbath and the Sabbath, if you followed the law as laid out by God through Moses, through his intermediary, there would be enough. And Jesus promises enough for us. And more than enough, he promises life that will last forever. Unlike your ancestors who ate and died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. And he's talking about the Eucharist. Now, we as Catholics are blessed to be able to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord. And he has given us something that in eating this, there is this comparison to earthly food, and we know that earthly foods diminish when you eat them, whether it's steak or ice cream or avocados or whatever it happens to be. You eat them up, you get full, you can even get sick on it. But this food that Jesus provides is not a food that is going to make you sick. You cannot get enough of it. As you receive it, it expands. He increases in us. And again, the early Christians knew this. The medievals knew this. We've known it for 2,000 years. The church writer, the church father, Tertullian, wrote in the 3rd century, talking about the flesh of Jesus and receiving the Eucharist. He said, the flesh is the hinge of salvation. The flesh is fed on the, our flesh is fed on the body of Christ so that the soul may grow fat on God. That almost sounds, that sounds almost insulting to God. He's going to feed us so much we can grow fat on him. He's going to nourish us and feed us. So much does he care for us, but so much, so powerful is this bread with which he will nourish us. And so Catholics are not cannibals. We're actually, we're crazier than cannibals because of what we believe. We don't just eat flesh, we eat the divinity of God. And we are strengthened and nourished. And this, this reception of communion then is a call to communion with God, a communion in the divine life. In the Catechism, paragraph 1325, we hear these words. The Eucharist is the efficacious sign and the sublime cause of that communion in the divine life and that unity of the people of God by which the church is kept in being. It is the culmination of God's action, sanctifying the world in Christ and of the worship men offer to Christ and through him to the Father in the Holy Spirit. So these receptions of Holy Communion, they call us. They, the, the, the communion is an efficacious sign. Sorry, the Eucharist is an efficacious sign pointing to something deeper. It's more than a sign, but it is the Godhead. 
It is Jesus himself present in the Eucharist causing us this communion. He's calling us to this communion that we might worship him and honor him. And so today we do so in Mass. We do so hopefully in a Eucharistic procession. And we do so as we examine our consciences and we eliminate those obstacles to communion with God. That sinfulness in our own lives that eliminates, that, that becomes an obstacle in our relationship with God, in our relationship with our neighbors, that pre- these sins that prevent us from fulfilling God's will in each one of our individual lives. You know, I, I talked about that accusation of cannibalism, it being repulsive. Well, hopefully one day we're going to find sin as repulsive because we are so in love with God, because we are so in love with the Eucharist, we find sin repulsive, like the people who responded to Jesus' teaching about receiving, eating his flesh and his blood. They were repulsed at that, but they, didn't have the, they did not have the eyes of faith. They had their own agenda with regards to what it was Jesus was teaching. They had their understanding and they, they weren't there yet. Some would come back, others would not. But what do we do? How do I respond to that call to communion with God? How do I respond in a, resp- in a call to go to confession, in a call to adhering more closely, more precisely to Christ's teaching through his church? And if there's confusion, the confusion's on our part, not God's part. If I have some idea about some teaching, maybe it's about human sexuality, or maybe it's about marriage, or something. But the Lord has given us a plan. He has given us an order in creation whereby to live out marriage, human relationships. They're reflected in, and you can find them in Revelation. You find them in the teachings of the church as we believe that marriage is a union between one man and one woman. And, and not some of these other uh, contrived. And as I say that, I, I wish no ill will or anything on people who may have some confusion in areas of sexuality. But I ask them to be open to what it is that God has planned with regards to the teachings of, of marriage and that the way that that is life-giving for the church. Just as Christ has given himself to his bride, the church, to give life, So too on the human level that families may give life to the world on the natural level, but then supernaturally within that life of family. But to refine that understanding and to be open to that understanding with regards to what it is the church teaches, because as there is a unity in the Eucharist, that Eucharistic communion leads to a union in belief, doctrinal communion, doctrinal purity, doctrinal unity. The Lord Jesus established a very clear direction and a clear sign with regards to his teachings on the Eucharist and the reception of his flesh and his blood. And so today on this Feast of Corpus Christi, we give him adoration and honor and praise and we glorify him and praise him. And again, I hope you're able to go at some point to just a church, even before the tabernacle, to adore the Lord in his Eucharistic presence. It doesn't just have to be on the Feast of Corpus Christi. Every day, to make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, to bend the knee, certainly if you have time to go to Mass, to gather in communion with your brothers and sisters in the Lord, to pray with them on, and in adoration of the Lord in his his real presence, because the Lord loves us, and he loves us with all of our warts, he loves us with all of our imperfections, and he continues to call us and invite us. I'd like to close with a story of a Eucharistic procession I was able to take part in in Rome in 1997, and it was the Feast of Corpus Christi on May the 29th, 1997, and we got to go to, the group I was with got to go to an outdoor mass with St. John Paul II in front of St. John Lateran Basilica. It was, a, it was a beautiful evening. It was a, just a, a phenomenal event. And there were 6,000 people present for this. And 
I'm going to Mass and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be just a, a beautiful, reverent, Eucharistic procession, you know, after the Mass. This is going to be really edifying. And I have to be honest, I've never been so disedified in all my life by all of the, the people running into each other and the, and the uh, there was, they had given all of us these candles with these little wax paper wind blockers. And we were supposed to carry these after we began the procession from St. John Lateran to St. Mary Major, carry these candles in procession. And the little kids were sword fighting with the candles. And at one point, someone's candle started that little wax paper wind blocker on fire and it turned into a little torch and it started a woman's hair on fire. And so we're in this Eucharistic procession trying to adore Jesus who's with St. John Paul II or the other way around. St. John Paul is with Jesus in this procession and this woman's hair is on fire and I thought, oh my gosh, here comes the church. It was just a, a kind of a strange, bizarre experience, but as I look back from 23 years ago, what I remember the most though is at the end when we all gathered in front of St. Mary Major and you had all of those people kneeling in adoration before the Eucharist, adoring our Lord, and then St. John Paul gave the benediction at the end. And we all just kind of dispersed. It's like we were all there to pray and adore and to give praise to God. And then we were to take those graces, we were to take them out back to wherever we were going to go, to the various corners of the world. And so the Lord has given himself to us. He has made himself a prisoner of the Eucharist so that we might, despite our own imperfections, despite our sinfulness, he gives us the grace to overcome those and then gives us the encouragement and the grace in order to build up his mystical body, the church. We pray for that in a special way on this day, and we ask in a special way Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was the first tabernacle, who was the first adorer of our Lord, to intercede for us and to give us that intercession and to help us more deeply love her son, truly present in the blessed sacrament. Praised be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen.